first thing about to preach. And but but I'll tell you, yeah. uh, after he got done, yeah. Amen. Amen. I was sure glad he had verse 16. Yes, sir. I I left I left challenged and convicted and moved and stirred. Yes, I don't know anybody that could have done with verse 16 what he did. Amen. And it's not the brilliance of man, it's it's the inexhaustibility Amen. of the book. Yeah. 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 Yes, yes, and isn't it an amazing thing that you can read a verse that you've read a thousand times, you've heard a hundred sermons on it, yes. nothing new about it. And then some man to get up and preach, and just God just give you a fresh burden sure. yeah. that word. Yes, sir. And Amen. it's just just amazing to me. And I certainly enjoyed it last night and Brother Brown. I uh, sure appreciate the message of reminding us of the goodness of God. Thank Amen. God for that. Yes. You know, uh, Brother Knox, um, you, you may know this, Brother Knox has his own personal transcriptionist. Uh, yeah. He has a man uh, in Florida that transcribes all of his sermons. And, and a couple of years ago, I, I somehow got on an email list. And so I, I guess about every week I get um, two or three sermons that are transcribed um, uh, by him. And, and a great, great resource. And I, I archive a lot of them. I don't have time to read them all, but archive them a lot. And and I know I know we preached like what eighty four sermons in Romans two or three or something like that, and so I thought well well when I when I got the list um, Romans two eleven is my text um, I, I didn't go to the Bible I went to the email <laughs> I thought I found that email then my work is done and I'm telling you I searched and searched and I could not find that email find it all. I do my own thing, I guess. I, <laughs> if there was ever an email I wish I'd have kept. That was it. <laughs> Romans 2.11. The text is only one verse, but it stands in the midst of a context. Sure. All of these verses are not meant as a standalone statement. But this verse is part of a much broader <laughs> statement that Paul makes on the judgment of God. Beginning all the way back in chapter 1 and verse 18, Paul has begun to lay out the case for the condemnation of man. Because only when a man feels condemnation will he plead to God for mercy. And Paul knew that you have to get a man lost before you can get him saved. And that's really what Romans 1, 2, 3 is all about. In the middle of all of this condemnation and judgment, we read, For there is no respect of persons with God. In chapter 1, of course, you know the heathen are judged, the immoral man that's described in that second half of that chapter that frankly describes much of America and Western culture. In chapter 2, the hypocrite is judged, the man who judges others by a different standard than he judges himself, boasts of his own goodness. In chapter 3, the Hebrew is judged, the Jew who boasts in his heritage, his religious rituals, thinking that he has favor with God because of his nationality. But the verdict is that all are condemned before God. Yep. Right. And that's the main Amen. case that God, that Paul makes in these chapters. I think that when some of the Jewish brethren read Romans chapter 1, they probably said a big amen at the end of it. Because Paul had really hit the nail on the head. He had nailed those heathen who had no knowledge of God. The way that they live, they're going to hell and they deserve it. And you know, really, you and I can have the same attitude. Yep. The doper, the yep. drunkard, the homosexual, the murderer, the rebel, they, they, they deserve judgment and they're going to get it one day. But if that's the only thing you take out of chapter 1, then you're not ready for chapter 2. Right. Right. Because in chapter 2, that same judgment that is reserved for the immoral man is also reserved for the moral and the religious man who still does not know God. Right, right. Our world has a very wrong conception about the judgment of God. There are some who don't even believe that God is a God of judgment. God would never send anybody to hell. The preacher who preaches a, that God is all love and that never never says anything about the wrath of God, he paints a very distorted picture of, of who God is. But then there are some who will concede, yes, God is a God of judgment and God will judge the world, but but he'll judge me differently because of how I live and, and there's a different standard for me and because I'm a good moral person then I surely will escape judgment. Judgment for you, judgment not for me. I, I, I've lived a good life. I'm a moral person. I, I give to charity. Three. And in Paul's day there was no 
body that was more proud of his morality than the Jew. Because his view of himself was too high, his view of God and God's judgment was too low. He was a moralist. He would read the sins of Romans chapter 1. He would check off everything that he did not do. But his morality gave him a false sense of security. It, it, it convinced him that I, I am not worthy of condemnation. And the Jew would, would say that God will blast all of the heathen and just, 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 just go ahead and wipe out all the Ninevites. But, but no Jew would say that, 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 that I will never be condemned to God because, well, frankly, because he was a Jew. But my ancestral, my, my religious trappings, that, that makes me a special case. By the way, all over these foothills, there's people that believe exactly the same thing. That's right. That's right. That's right. My grandmother was a Christian. I, I belong to the Baptist church. I, I've been at the same job yeah. for, for 40 years. I, I've never been in trouble with the law. I, I pay all of my taxes. Yeah. And, and you don't find me at the honky tonk on Friday night. And you don't see me getting drunk. You've never heard of me beating my wife. I've never stolen anything from my neighbor. You see, all of us can find somebody else in just a little bit worse shape than I am right. and make that my standard. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I can very easily go stand in Romans chapter 1 and I, I feel good about myself because I'm not doing any of those things. None of that applies to me. And that's why Paul continues in Romans <clears throat> chapter 2. For the moral man who may feel good reading Romans chapter 1 and wants to excuse himself for being so good. But when we come to Romans chapter 2, we take up the theme of the moral man, especially epitomized in that day by the Jew. And Paul's verdict is that he is without excuse as well. Chapter 1 and verse 20, the heathen man is without excuse. Chapter 2 verse 1, he is still without excuse. Now, what would cause a man to be deceived by his own self-righteousness and convince himself that he, of all people, is good enough not to face judgment? Because the next person that you had to track to believes that. It is very rare to find somebody that says, yes, I'm a sinner, and I'm going to hell, and I deserve to go there. Nobody thinks that they deserve the wrath of God. Right. Either God is a, is not a God of wrath, or He's not a God of wrath for me. He's for the bad actors, but certainly not for me. Right. Yeah. I think that you'll find three false views of God that leads men to that self-deception. There, in this chapter, I'll back up and and just come back to chapter one, just just to have a little bit of runway to, to get to verse number eleven. But in verse number one through three, and Brother Brown has already preached it. There is a false view of God's justice. Self-righteousness always leads to self-deception. Yeah. Yeah. Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judges, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doest the same things. I can point to the immoral man and boast that those are things that I don't do. But if you and I looked into our heart as deeply as God does, you would find out that we're just as guilty as they are. I have never bowed down to an idol. I have had idolatry in my heart. I have never dibbled another woman. I have had lust in my heart. I, I have never murdered man. I have harbored anger and spite in my heart toward another person. We commit all, we all commit the same sins. We do them differently, some inwardly and some outwardly. But your self-righteousness is not going to be an admissible defense in God's court. Self-righteousness is mistaken for real righteousness. Yes, and then in verse 2, we're sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. He just mentioned the verdict of God is according to truth. God knows the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth about you and I. Yep. A human judge may, may, may make a faulty judgment because he doesn't know the truth or maybe some truth is not admissible because of the rules of evidence. That will not be the case with God. Right. Yeah. Amen. Verse number three, thinkest thou this old man that judges which them which doest such things and doest the same that thou should escape the judgment of God? Do you really think that? Do you really believe that God is going to judge others and not judge you? Right. It is a fatal mistake to presume upon the justice of God. 
And then I'll just touch this because he already preached on it. In verse 4 and 5, there's a flawed view of God's justice. He, he read these verses. There, there's, there's, there's a theological term for, for, for the thinking in verse 4 and 5, and it's, it's retribution theology. And it teaches that there is a direct link between my circumstances in life now, God's approval of me based upon those circumstances, and then what I will experience in the life to come. If in this life you enjoy a good life, that must mean somehow that God is pleased with you, that God approves you that God excuses you for whatever demerits that you have and you will be okay in the life to come by the way the Jew really rested in retribution theology they mistook the blessings of God the goodness of God for the fact that God was being pleased with them and that gave them false assurance that they surely will not be judged by God you and I know that enjoying a good life down here has nothing to do with your eternal destiny right? Right. Amen. It's already preached. What is the intent of the goodness? It's to lead men to repentance. Yes. It's not Amen. for you to yes. think that you deserve more or that you have immunity from judgment. No, it is for you to realize that a good life down here does not mean that you have passed God's approval, that he's okay with your sin, but he is drawing you, he is wooing right. you. And when you realize the goodness of God, it will help you understand that if you come to God in humility and repentance, he will treat you the way he always has has and that is with grace and goodness. Amen. And the flaw of view of God's goodness. But then in verse 6 through 16 there is a flaw of view of God's judgment. And in these verses Paul lays out the standards of judgment that God will judge men by. I'll just mention them in verse 6 through 10. He will judge man by his deeds. In verse number 12 through 15 he will judge man according to the law. In verse 16 he will judge according to our heart. And in the middle of it, we have our text. For there is no respect of persons with God. Yes, sir. In every principle that Paul gives, he, he's answering an argument. There is an imaginary conversation where Paul anticipates an argument and, and then he answers it. And I am concerned with only one argument in my text, and it is this. Is it fair? Is it fair for God to judge the moral man on the same standard as he judges the immoral man. Shouldn't your goodness count for something? Shouldn't it give you some extra standing before God? Shouldn't God view the moral man more favorably than the heathen? And the answer to that is no. There is no respect of persons with God. God is fair. God is righteous. God is just. God is impartial. No respect doesn't mean that he's ever regarded man, it means he doesn't regard one man more than another based on external circumstances. Yeah, right. yeah. No respect to persons yeah. with God. Good. I looked at my text over the last several months and pondered and meditated upon this. There was a couple of thoughts that came to my, to my mind. Here's the first one. And that is that God demonstrates impartiality in his character. The statement is actually a statement about the character of God. We know God by his attributes. God, God is love. God is omniscient. God is a God of power. The character of God is that he is just. He is unbiased. He is, he is completely unprejudiced. He is completely objective. There are several passages I want you to turn with me. And I want you to hold, hold your finger here. Go to 2 Chronicles chapter 19. We're going to look at several verses. I've got to hurry. 2 Chronicles chapter 19. And this is Jehoshaphat appointing Judges, and he's going to charge them with being fair. So 2 Chronicles 19, look at verse number 4. Jehoshaphat dwelt in Jerusalem, went out through the people from Beersheba to Mount Ephraim, brought them back unto the Lord God of their fathers, and he sent judges in the land throughout all the fenced cities of Judah, city by city, and said to the judges, Take heed what ye do. For ye judge not for man, but for the Lord, who is with you in the judgment. Wherefore now let the fear of the Lord be upon you. Take heed and do it. For there is no iniquity with the Lord our God, nor respect to persons, nor taking of gifts. He charges these judges with being impartial in their judgment because God is impartial in his judgment. Yep. You, you know, yep. and as, much, as much as we would not want to admit it, we do act exactly the opposite. We really do. Um, and and, and, and I, I believe that there is a two-tiered system of judge, justice even in our country. 
And if somebody says, well, well, the system is flawed, I don't believe so. I believe that the system of justice that we have is the best in the world, but when flawed men are in charge of that system, that's where it all falls apart. But God is just. Uh, uh, there's no partiality with God. He doesn't play favorites. He, he's not prejudiced. And, and just to cement that thought in our mind, I, I want to give you some of the things that may influence us, but never influence God. All right, we're, we're, we're going to run quickly. First Samuel chapter 16. First Samuel chapter 16. I, 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 I wasn't given a time limit. I heard him say 32 minutes, and so I... I, I'm, I'm thinking I have 32 minutes, Is that, so I'm, I'm, I'm moving. 1 Samuel 16 and verse 7. The Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance, nor on the height of his stature, because I refuse him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. God is not influenced by appearances. Right. He's right. not influenced by how you look, nor has he ever been. Right. I am, um, I... I despise shopping. I hate it. I hate it more than any man that has ever lived. Especially if it's in a mall. Malls give me headaches. They're, they're, I'm, I'm allergic to it. I, 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 I despise it. I haven't been in a mall in probably a year, but but a couple of days ago, weeks weeks ago, my, my, I was out with my wife in Pensacola, and, and she wanted to stop by the mall and go one of those um, uh, body and beyond uh, bath, um, uh, you know, where they sell the candles and all that stuff. So so so, I, like a dutiful husband, I we go into the mall, we can find that place, and I'm not going in there. And, and so I I sit on a bench uh, out, out in the right. in the thing, and right. and sitting there like a whipped puppy, mad because I'm there. And, and, and the only entertainment that I have is people watching. Yeah, yeah. I love to watch people. I, I, and, and I'll be honest with you, I'm, I'm very judgmental. I, I think I'm probably right in my judgment, but, but I, I'm watching people. Watching people. You know, people really ought to look in the mirror before they go out in public. Yeah. Right. 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 And I'm thinking, did you really mean to come out in your pajamas today? <laughs> and I'm thinking, I'm, I'm thinking, this guy, you know, if you buy britches that fit, you wouldn't have to hold them up one hand and walk all bow and trying yeah. to keep them on. And yeah. I, I'm just, I'm just devaluating is what I'm yeah. doing. Yeah. And I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm saying, he's got money, he ain't got no money. <laughs> he's got a good job, he's probably on welfare. Yeah. She's married. She will never get married. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just sure. I don't know these people. I don't know these people. I'm judging on appearances. But appearances do not influence God. Right. Uh, look, look at Deuteronomy chapter 10. Here's something else that doesn't influence God. He's impartial in his character. Deuteronomy 10, look at verse number 17. For the Lord your God is God of God, for the Lord is a great God, a mighty and terrible, which regardeth not persons, nor taketh reward. Right. Poor people are usually taken advantage by a crooked court system that never happens with God. You can't bribe God. Yep. Right. Now somebody said, well, who would try? Well, they try all the time. Yes. Yeah. Right? I mean, I mean, God, let me tell you what I've done for you lately. Do, do you see my penance, oh Lord? I'm, I'm going to church only for you. Make sure you watch the offering. God, I'm putting this in and I expect it back threefold. And I know that God blesses good works, but if you're trying to get off the hill foot for rejecting Jesus Christ, you're good. not going to be able good. to good. manipulate good. God. Amen. Amen. He's not influenced with bribes. Job 34. Job chapter 34. Show you something else that does not influence God. Job 34. Look at verse number 18. Job 34, verse number 18, is it fit to say to a king, thou art wicked, and the prince is your ungodly? How much less to him that accepteth not the persons of princes, nor regardeth the rich more than the poor, for they are all the work of his hands. He is not impressed with your wealth. Amen. He's not impressed with your position. He's right. not impressed with your rank in this world. Yeah. The rich have no more say with him than the poor. Amen. Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2, look at verse 5. Paul writing, to whom we gave place by subjection, nope, not for an hour. That the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Watch this, but of those who seem to be somewhat, whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me, God accepteth no person. For they who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. Paul's harking back to 
the dispute in, April, in, in, in Acts 15 over circumcision where he and Barnabas stood before of the Jerusalem council. He was a nobody and he stood before all those apostles, but, but God's not influenced by your influence. He's, he's not moved by your reputation. He's not denigrating the office of apostle, but he's saying God doesn't have favorites even with the apostles. Yep. In other words, there's no famous Christians with him. There are no Christian celebrities as far as God is concerned. Yeah, right. One more, Galatians 3. You're there, Galatians 3, page over, verse 27. For as many as you have been baptized in Christ, have been put on Christ, have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, neither bond nor free, neither male nor female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. If you have believed on Jesus Christ, you're Abraham's seed, whether you have a drop of Jewish blood in you or not, you're the spiritual seed of Abraham because you have the, the faith of Abraham. And it doesn't mean that I'm no longer a Gentile or the Jew is no longer a Jew. It simply means that in Christ it doesn't matter. Yep. God, God doesn't judge based upon ethnicity or, or racist right. divides. He doesn't judge yep. on financial status because if you're rich or poor, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, male or female. We are all equal with Him. Amen. I, I'm working on a series right now. I don't know if I'm preaching or not, but on, on, on social justice and critical race theory and intersexuality. Boy, that's really pervaded our, our culture, and, and, and God has no part in that. He's impartial in His right. character. Yep. Second thought that I have when I looked at our text is not only is God impartial in his character, but God demands impartiality of his creatures. Not only is God no respecter of persons, he expects that of you and I as well. Amen. All authority is delegated authority. And if you ever sit in a seat of authority, you must bear in mind that your authority comes from God. Romans 13 tells us that. The rulers are ministers of God to do good and to punish evil. And if impartiality is a part of who he is, impartiality ought to be a part of who we are. Leviticus 19 and verse 15, you should do no unrighteousness in judgment. Thou shalt not respect the person of the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty, but in righteousness shalt thou judge thy neighbor. Don't judge people on external factors, whether wealthy or poverty. Don't, don't let somebody's financial standings influence you. The, the poor, the poor often get treated worse and the rich get treated better. That's a miscarriage of true justice. Look in Deuteronomy chapter 1. Deuteronomy chapter 1, give me just a couple of verses so you don't think that I'm making it up. Deuteronomy chapter 1 and verse 16. And I charged your judges at that time, saying... Hear the causes between your brethren and judge righteously between every man and his brother and the stranger that is with him. Ye shall not respect persons in judgment, but ye shall hear the small as well as the great. Ye shall not be afraid of the face of man, for the judgment is God's and the cause is too hard for you. Bring it unto me and I will hear it. Moses places judges in place to judge the smaller matters that come before, between men. And he says you're standing in God's place and since he's not partial in judgment, then you don't be partial right. as well. Amen. And when we're given a sphere of authority, whether it is in the home with children, whether it is in the workplace, whether it's law enforcement, we are to treat people the same. Amen. Psalm 82. Psalm chapter 82. Here it is again. Psalm 82. And isn't it it's amazing to, to me how, how many amens there are on the impartiality of God. They die off when it comes to us. Yeah. <laughs> Psalm 82, verse 2, how long will ye deal unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked? See, the defend of the poor and fatherless, do justice to the afflicted and needy. We would say don't be prejudiced against one, don't show favoritism to another. One is negative and one is positive. Favoritism is to show favor based solely on external circumstances. Prejudice is to be against somebody, to judge one based simply on external circumstances. That's a biased judgment. God has no part in it. Amen. By the way, that even comes into the church. 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy 5, I'll, I'll back up to verse 19. Against an elder receive not an accusation but before two or three witnesses. Here's the opposite of it. Them that sin rebuke before all that others may fear. I charge thee there that thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that thou observe these things without preferring one before another, doing nothing by partiality. In verse number 19, he's talking about an elder that has been accused of some sin. In verse number 20, he is caught in sin. 
And we're moving from the secular court and the court of public opinion. We're moving into the realm of church discipline. And the principle is the same. And the principle is don't allow yourself to be prejudiced against one. And be quick to believe some juicy gossip because of your prejudice. But then don't be so quick to dismiss the sin of an elder because he's a big preacher or because he has a big reputation. No, do it without partiality. James chapter 2, James chapter 2. You know this passage. Boy, James really lays it out. James 2, 1. My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect to persons. For if there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring in goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile, make me raiment, and I can almost see both of them coming in Sunday morning. And yet respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say to him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool. Are ye not then partial in yourselves, and are become judges of evil thoughts? The sinner that walks into our auditorium that is poorly dressed and disheveled should be treated with the same kindness and same dignity as a sinner who comes in wearing a suit driving a Lexus. Yep. Amen. And God help us if we ever think that one is more desired than the other. Right. Yes. Right. God help us if we ever become spiritual snobs and we look down on a brother yeah. or a sister yeah. because of their race or their education or their looks or their social status or any other petty external. Amen. You know, Amen. because of our beliefs, we are often labeled things that we are, we are not. If you believe that homosexuality is a sin, then you're homophobic. If you may believe that a man should be a leader in the home, then, then you're in a position of, of leadership, then, then you're a sexist or, or what's the word, misogynist. But we're not any of those things. Right. We're not racist. We're not homophobic. We're not bigots. We're not sexist. Right. We treat people the same. Yeah. We respect one another the same. Men. I love my neighbor. I have a white neighbor on one side. I have a black neighbor on the other side. They're both my neighbor. Invited right. both of them to church. Right. Real estate for both of them. Treat them all the same. Right. And by the way, if you have any vestiges of any of that in you, it would be a good day to recognize it for the sin that it is, confess it, and ask God to right. change in your heart. Right. Amen. Because God demonstrates impartiality in his character. He Amen. is impartial. And God demands impartiality in his creatures. But I take you back to our text. That God displays impartiality to the condemned. Because once more, verse 11 stands in the context of condemnation. It is telling you that in the future judgment, God is going to judge all men with impartiality. Yes. He's going to judge you by the same standards. And nothing outside of himself and his law will influence God. Every secret would be they know all of the evidence against you will be considered. No favors, no bribes, no two tiers of justice, no special treatment. He has no respect of persons. Mm -hmm. You know what it's supposed to do? It's supposed to work conviction in your heart. Amen. Yes. Amen. By the way, the time you yep. get to Romans 3.21, I'm not preaching on it. By the time you get to Romans 3, 21 and 22, the sinner ought to be thoroughly convicted yes, of his right. sin. Whether right. he is the heathen of chapter 1, or the moralist of chapter 2, right. or the Hebrew of chapter 3, he ought to know by now that he has nothing to yes. offer God. And if you are yes. going to stand righteous before God, it will not be in your own righteousness because you have none. Right. And the sinner reads three chapters of condemnation and realizes that he stands naked before a righteous God and that God will not be bribed and that God will not be straight and he will not be impartial. That is judgment. <clears throat> but I was reading this morning. I read one more verse. And it is Romans 3 and verse 22. And I don't know what your verse is, Brother Ray, but I'm not preaching in the case that is. But even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, Here's a great statement for the Calvinist. Unto all yes, yes, and upon yes, all yes. that believe. For there yes, is yes, no yes, difference. Yes, Still impartial. Yes, I heard about justice, but then I heard about grace. And I knew that yes, I was condemned yes, in my sin, but then I heard yes, that Jesus Christ died for yes, my sin. I, yes, I heard that yes, I was not righteous, yes, but then I heard that Jesus was righteous. And through the miracle of grace, that righteous judge would actually impute the righteousness yes, of his son yes, to my account. And I could literally stand before that impartial God. 
God in the righteousness of his sin that when God considers all of the evidence, he sees the evidence of Jesus saving life and sees me standing there and he declares me righteous. Yes. Yes. I said, oh, but I'm poor. I have nothing to offer. There is no difference. Yes. Amen. Amen. So, oh, I'm a preacher. I, I have not lived a moral life. There is no difference. Amen. Oh, I'm a preacher. I come from the wrong side of the tax, but there is no Amen. difference. Amen. Amen. See, the impartiality of God can work against you, or it can work. Yes. 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 If you reject Jesus Christ, I tell you that you will stand at the judgment of God, and you will face a judge, a righteous judge, who is completely without favoritism and completely without prejudice, and his verdict will be based on his perfect knowledge of you and his holy law and his righteous demands, and he will not consider your nationality. He will not consider your ethnicity. He will not consider your wealth. He he will not consider your influence. He will not check to see how many followers you have on Facebook. He will not see how high you've made it up in society. He will not care what you're accomplished in your job. What other people think will not influence the job, Judge. But there is another side to the coin. That is that he's not just saving rich people. He's not just saving influential yes. people. Because he is impartial in his judgment, he is also impartial in his offer of salvation. He yes. saves the moral and the immoral, yes. the high and the lowly, the Jew and the Gentile. And some of you were not the saving kind. Some of you should have been passed yes. out. Some of you should not have gotten in the line. Yes. Some of you know that you're not the cream of any crop. You're not the head of any class. You're not the who's who of anybody. But you came anyway. And you said I don't deserve anything. I don't have anything to offer. But I come. I trust in your son, Jesus Christ. Nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to the cross I pray. And all that matters to an impartial God. Amen. I, I tell you, I tell you, I've got a very good Hallelujah. You can read Romans 2.11 and you can tremble at it. You can read Romans 2.11 and yes. you can shout. Yes. Amen. It just depends on which side of the cross yeah. that you stand on. Yes. Yes. There is no respect to persons. Amen. Amen. Hey. Hey. My Father, I'm thankful that the ground stands level at the foot of the cross. Yes. We should have found no standing there. I should have been passed up. I had nothing. Nothing to offer. Not a thing. But you saved me anyway. With no consideration to my heritage, to my morality, to my wealth. Nothing. All that mattered is I trusted your son. Yes, sir. And I thank you for it. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.